amazingly, and, and it, this is the sort of coincidence that slightly freaks me out, I decided to go into my collection of soccer stars this afternoon. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I've got probably, I've got a few hundred probably just tucked away in, you know, in these, if you remember those little packets you used to get. Yeah, yeah, of course. And do you know who the first one who dropped out of the packet? And I'll give you a clue. It wasn't a Palace player. Oh. It was actually this man who is Jimmy Greenoff. Wow. Who not only played in this game that you went to, he also scored the first goal for Stoke. How about that? It, it, that's amazing. Yeah. That is, um, it's, um, and again, but just looking at that picture, it, how plain the kit is. It's just yeah. red and white stripes. No. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because um, Brian Moore is gets so excited because at the end, I can't think of his name now, but Stoke, the, the one one substitute, imagine that. The yeah, yeah. Stoke substitute who comes on with 10 minutes to go and it's a centre-back. Um, and Brian yeah. Moore says, this is this is amazing. The, the centre-backs come on, obviously, to to cause some to mischief up front. And I think he scores. He does, Smith. yeah. Smith, Smith, wasn't it? Was it Smith? Dennis Smith, maybe? Well, well of course, but, he scored in the last 10 minutes against Palace. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing it since yeah. 1973, <laughs> all the way through. I mean, 50-odd so, years, don't worry about it. We keep doing it. But but it, it, it's interesting that Brian Moore is, is almost flabbergasted by this. And in, and I, I was laughing at that, but then I thought, hang on a second. I don't think many managers would do that. Would do that now. I know occasionally Roy Hodgson would, would throw uh, Anderson up front for the last five mm. minutes. But if, if you were to see, uh, it, it, if Klopp threw Van Dijk on up front for the last five minutes again, people would go, he's, he's lost the plot. What's the matter? Yeah, yeah. And, and yet I thought it was hilarious that Brian Moore thought this was incredible. And mm. and in fact, it was it, it was a move. It wasn't ahead of its time because no one copied it. But it's like literally, you can hear Brian Moore shaking his head, going, "I don't know, I don't know what they're doing." But, but that's <laughs> it's amazing that that picture. I wish I'd. I've never really had a a collecting mentality in that. As as even as a kid, I would I would start collecting something and then just forget. Yeah. It's like the, the amount of times you know a magazine would come out. And it's got a football, so you buy the first three mm. magazines, and you think, "Oh, this is going to be a brilliant collection." And then two years later, you go, "Oh, fuck! I wish I'd, I wish it turns out." Yeah. You know, and then twenty years later, it turns out they're worth a thousand quid on, on it. It's like the shoot. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the people of our generation will always remember the sh the shoot league tables. Like the, yeah. Before the first week of the season, shoot magazine gave you a cardboard thing with all the thoughts and little cardboard tags with the teams. Tags, in. Yeah. So you could move them up and down. And for the first two weeks of the season, I would do that religiously and then just get really bored and think to myself, oh, I'll just look at the paper. Yeah, but this, <laughs> which was our, own, was our only option then as well. One of my yeah. one of my earliest memories is on a on a Saturday evening, my my dad would send me down for what they called the classified newspaper. So you had the evening in London, you had the evening standard and the evening news. Evening news, yeah. And and then uh, so you'd go to the news agent and there'd be a, about twenty people. And then about five to six, ten to six, um a van would come screaming up uh, mm -hmm. and they would throw these classified newspapers out because that was the only way you could confirm the scores. Because you know the, they would show the score. You had the, the BBC Vidi printer of, of blessed yeah. memory, which again I tried to explain that to Ed. Just going, well, it's like a typewriter, and and the the, the the team's names would come up, and then you'd wait for the score. And it was always really exciting. Yeah. If Palace were away, and you knew they were one nil up at half time, and if it came up, if Barnsley nil, full time, we'd yeah. won, we'd won. Yeah. But then, but to confirm that score, the only option we had was to wait for the those evening newspapers, and you would double check just to make sure the BBC had got it right. <laughs> and then, you know, there's no match reports or anything because they just they just gave you the score and and, the, and then you'd get the Sunday paper for the league table, which was the only way you could actually check the league. Oh, actually, do you know what? Despite everything I say about not being nostalgic, I'm getting quite nostalgic doing this. Yeah, <laughs> it's what happens to people. We go down it's avenues a, and yeah. suddenly it gets you. But, but, it's, um... it, but it's funny though. Do you know, I was, I was with um, 
I, I did a gig recently at the Comedy Store, and I was with Josh Widdicombe and, and uh, mm. Sean Walsh. And Josh Widdicombe, uh, Sean, you know, Sean's a QPR fan. Josh is a, a Plymouth fan, obviously. Plymouth fan, yeah. But but it, it's really interesting because they they quite like hearing what granddad's stories, right? but they're they're just <laughs> as nostalgic for the football of the nineties. Yeah, as as we are, yeah, you because know, that's their generation. That's what they grew up in, and mm. they're, they're obsessed with the, with kits of the nineties, with players of the nineties, with haircuts of the nineties, in the same way that that I am with no, obsessed is not the right word, but f- fascinated as I am with with all those things in the in the nineteen seventies. And it's like they, you know, mm. Josh will be able to tell you the adverts at, at Home Park in the nineteen nineties. In the same way that I can still remember, we had Van Heusen shirts were advertised at Sellers. But for some reason, a, a, a car franchise, Volkswagen Collindale, advertised mm-hmm. at Sellers. And Collindale, you can't get further away in London and still be in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part than, than Collindale. And there's a, a big banner advert for the Croydon Advertiser. And of, you, and, and of course, you watch it. And again, that's something else that Ed pointed out when I showed him this, what's this big match. He said... He said, "How come the adverts aren't moving?" So they, they, <laughs> they, they didn't. And then, of course, he's at, at half time. And when he went back for the start of the second half, in the background, you could see the the half time score scores. Yeah, on the A, A B, B C. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you you'd look in the program, and A would be Liverpool, Man City, and somebody mm. a, a kid would put the things up. And that would be it, because he went, well, where's yeah. the scoreboard? I said, there wasn't a scoreboard. He said, well, how did you know what the score was? I said, because we had attention spans in those days. We could count. Yeah. We didn't yeah, have to we look at a... our phone. Completely <laughs> exactly. our so we, we didn't have to look it. at a giant screen to realise that we were three two, still 3-2 three, up. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I think it's interesting what you say about collecting. I am very similar to you in that I just got slightly bored after the third week and just thought... I can't really be asked for this. Some of the commentators I've spoken to. So I think Guy Mowbray, certainly, Seb Hutchinson were obsessed and they did it every week. Yeah, yeah. So they checked it. They they even did the Scottish tables, which, let's face it, no one is interested in the Scottish tables. I don't give a shit if Morton have beaten Rage Rovers. Yeah. But they used to just avidly do it. And I think... That's probably why they're, you know, high profile commentators. And that's why I, we're here scrabbling around trying to find yeah. memories that we like. Well, that's, that's, that's really, I mean, uh, I actually quite like Scottish football. So, do when, I, just but just, but uh, only because uh, as a kid growing up, I just used to love the names. I used to be yeah. fascinated by these, the, these incredible names. And one of my, it's still one of my favorite ever football photographs. It's from, I think it's 1969 or 1970. And I'm not a big fan of Twitter in general. You kind of, you have to do it these days if you're, if you're in the media to any extent. But I remember this, I, I tweeted about this particular photograph. It was in Shoot magazine. And it was Celtic versus Dunfermline. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and there was a Dunfermline player who was in such pain from a tackle that he was biting the shin pad of a, of a Celtic player. So I, I tweeted about a year ago, is this a false memory? Have I got this right? And suddenly was was confronted with hundreds of photographs of the, of this image. And it was like, but so I used to like Scottish football. And of course, with with Irish family, in the end, you, you've got no choice but to follow Celtic and, yeah. and Hibs. But the, the commentators thing is fascinating because I, I've met a lot of commentators. Guy Mowbray, uh, has got a powder blue sports car. Guy, Guy Mowbray is a... Has he really? Did, he, didn't have, he wasn't in that when I was in it, 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 uh, yeah, he he got, around the back. The big, big York City, big York City fan as well. But yeah, all yeah. commentate, all commentators have a have a, 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 a almost identical mindset, mm. and and Agreed. and all of them are characterised by what you explain that that kind of. Uh, not just a love for stats, but a love for order. It's like I, I worked with John Motson on several occasions. John Motson was a big advocate of mine on, on Match of the Day too, and I liked I, 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 John Watson was was how should we put it? He was very much a man's man. He had old fashioned views yes, about yes. A, a woman's place in football. But I liked John a lot. Um, he was fascinating, and 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 
the love that people... I remember being at Cheltenham. I used to do Cheltenham Festival for Five mm-hmm. Live. And I remember on the Monday night before the festival, we were at one of these preview nights in a, in a tent and John Motson was there with Ronnie Radford. He became his best mate after oh, scoring yeah, yeah, the yeah. go. So, and, and John, so we went in and John went, John called us over and, I said, can I buy you a drink? And I went, John, there's, there's eight or nine of us. And he went, no, it's fine. Uh, and John just raised his voice. And suddenly about 200 Irish people turned around and went, this is John Mutton. Can I get you a drink? And he went, yes. And so <laughs> he, it's, but he's, he's, he showed me his notes once, uh, his commentating notes, um, which he used to sell on eBay after every game for about 30 quid. But they were a work of art and beauty. He would, he would colour. So each player... He would write down each player's name. Uh, so the defenders, I think, red, midfield, blue. And then on the right-hand side, he'd have these columns with with, with just general stats. And then over uh, on the far side, he'd have little individual quirky facts about their their wow. career or things that they'd done that he would hope to be able to use. But he never... His, his, John Watson had this... It, one thing about modern commentators, he said they all they all try and crowbar something in. So they all they all think of a clever line and then try and crowbar it in. He said, whereas I I, I will wait for it to happen. But they've all got that same mind. They've all got that ordered mm. mind. And also, there's that strange thing. They're all a lot of them have said uh, have, have used the same analogy that they're like referees in that they they love football, but realise from an early age they had no chance of being footballers. Mm-hmm. So they wanted to be involved in football somehow, but I, I, and also God love them. All all the commentators you hear, e- even now it's unusual. They've all had to sort of, for want of a better word, pay their dues. They've all come through. Oh, gotcha. Local radio and and then or built their way up. Hospital radio in the old or day, hospital yeah. radio, whatever. And and it's why I get so. This is one of the things that I'm pleased about myself. Is like, although I do admit to a certain nostalgia, I I absolutely resist any temptation to be to turn that into being gammon if you like to be in reactionary to it's like mm-hmm. the the stick that female commentators even now like jackie oatley was a, a, a friend of mine who was mm-hmm. the first the first woman to commentate on on uh match of the day yeah. and i she showed me some of the, the stick she got not and this is not just from male football fans it's stuff from some men within the sporting industry itself so she always said and and i was um the the famous incident when the uh sean massey the yeah, yeah. female the assistant referee and- gave the offside yeah. i was with jackie Oatley at fulham in the press room when that when that happened so that was the the, the early kickoff game uh and as and jackie Oatley went that's that's definitely offside but all these male journalists yeah, what the, the but she pointed out jackie, that she Jackie Oatley's forgotten more about football than I know, but she points out that every single female commentator has to know more about football than any man. Oh, it's the, it's the yeah, first yeah. prerequisite. And yet there's still some people who go, oh, their voices are too high pitched. You can't, you can't, it's it's just ludicrous. But even, but even, but I think even Jackie would admit that she's got that commentator's mentality that you spoke about, that, that need for order, that need for, for getting all the statistics in a row, for getting, um, yeah, yeah. But for because they have this terror of being of being caught out in a way they have this and it, and it's really interesting oh well, because I remember John Watson talking about how Brian Moore uh, no it's I think it was John Watson who one of the commentators got some stick once because they they couldn't tell John Chidozzi from um, Laurie Cunningham when they were playing for two oh, really? when, they were, or when they were playing for Orient. Uh, and whichever commentator it was was mortified by that for the the rest of his life because he said it was nothing. It simply hadn't done my research properly. Those were the days when they didn't have names on the back of the shirts. You had That's numbers something. that were sometimes obscured. He said, but John Watson said you always came up with a in the same way that John Hunt is a very good friend of mine. He's uh, mm-hmm. BBC racing BBC star. racing commentator mm-hmm. who who for me is the best commentator of any sport ever. He's, he's a genius. But John Hunt can recognise a, a, a horse. If you if you show John Hunt a horse, not not with a jockey on it in colour, you just show John Hunt a horse and he'll tell you what that horse is because yeah, yeah. he's got a little thing. Each animal has got a specific 
you know, funny shaped ear or or a yeah, longer yeah. T- yeah. So and also as he says, I, 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 it's my job. I look at horses seven yeah. days a week. But John Watson had this thing where every player had a particular characteristic that he he would spot mm. at, at, at a distance, which is which is really there's. I, th- I always think there's something slightly on the spectrum about commentators. Oh, I think slightly. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, um, <laughs> I mean, they are. Seb Hutchinson talks talks actually uh, about the gait of players. That's often what uh, he looks. Wow, for. that's so, interesting. Because we his first game was actually QPR Arsenal back in the eighties. Uh, was it no, no nineties? Sorry, it was a Premier League game. And Andy Impey, he said, had this yeah. way of running. And he said, you could tell him a mile off. You could you could take out everything. And it's like, ha- he said, Harland as well. If you just took Harland out, you know, all the hair and the blue, the way he moves, it can only be Harland. So that, again, well, is that's interesting. something about the, you know, the focus of these people and, and what they look at beyond what us ordinary mortals do. So, that's really it. Well, it, well Impy, I get, because Andy Impy had those very square shoulders. He did, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. always looked like he had a nineteen eighties power dress on, and, and it turned. But <laughs> that's, but that's that's really interesting. And there's the Harland yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, until you said it's... that, now I would. You, you, yeah, you would be able to. I, I also, if, if you took it all out, all the silhouette, you would know that was Harland. The, the thing I love about Harland as well is that he's a he's a proper throwback centre forward. Harland, you, you get the feeling with Harland. Yeah. That he doesn't really care if Man City win or lose. As long as he scores, he's mm. happy. But what I love about him is that he talks all the way through. The game. He's always, and he oh, looks yeah. like he's smiling most of the time. That's right. But yeah, he yeah. talks all the way through. And I, I remember uh, Damien Delaney. It's mm-hmm. probably, probably the hardest centre back Palace have had. I would, I would say. I remember him. I, I, I Damien was very clever. Yeah, and very into politics. I met him at one of the Player of the Year dues, um, uh, and he started trying to wind me up. And um, I can't remember what Clint Hill said to him. He's a professional comedian. Don't wind you up. He's going to go on stage and he will take the piss, which I then did. So Damien and I wanted, but Damien asked me if he could go to um, uh, a recording of I Got News for You. He said, I love that show. It's one of my favourite shows. Can you get me to I said, of course. So, um I got him a ticket, and, and before the show, I, I showed him around the studio and I, I introduced him to Ian Hislop and uh, Paul Merton. And Paul's a big football fan; he didn't have a clue, but Paul's a, a big football fan. But Richard Osman was on on the show that night, wow. uh, and, and Richard Richard came running out. And said, oh, really? Uh, Richard likes meeting people. So, Damien, this is Richard. Damien, yeah, I know who he is, and then they had, a, they had a, a brief chat about politics and life, love, and the universe, and, and then. Um, Richard said to him, oh, I've got to thank you at Palace for, for taking the worst centre-back we've ever had at, at Fulham off, mm-hmm. off our hands. I know and, what you're going to say. And, and the, eye, the, the light went out and David Delaney went, who's that? Who are you talking about? And Richard clearly realised that it, it, David wasn't joking. And he went, well, you know, yeah. I'd, say the, I'd say the worst. He was never very... And David went, tell us, what, what's his name? He went, Britta Hangerland. Hangerland. And David Delaney picked him up with a scruff on the neck and put him up against the wall. He said, so have you ever played professional football? And Richard went, no, 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 I haven't. Uh, oh. and, he read, and he read, Breda Hangland, Breda Hangland's one of the best players I've ever played with. He's a fantastic footballer. He's had injury problems. And, uh, and, and Richard's like, yeah, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And, and, and we got to the end of the corridor and, and David Delaney just said to me, Hangland, shit. But, <laughs> But he wasn't going to tell you. But, but I remember talking to, yeah, to, yeah. to Damien Delaney. And Damien Delaney said the, the best game, the game he enjoyed most in his career was Palace Chelsea against mm-hmm. Diego Costa. Yeah. And he said Costa was a nightmare. He said Costa just ch- ch- chatted. He said just chatted all the way through. It's in his face all the way through. It's punching him. It was pinching him. was doing all sorts of yeah. shit. And at the end of the game... Diego, Diego Costa hugged him and said, "That's the best play. You're, that's the best ninety minutes I've ever had." Because Damien said, "I just took this up." You know, he said, "When you've grown up, he played at every level of English football." He mm. said, "When you've had some big twat at Mansfield kicking yeah. lumps out, you're not you worried should, about yeah. Diego Costa." Uh, but Diego Costa was just—he uh, said, "You didn't, you didn't bite, you didn't, you didn't, 
take you. I didn't get you sent on. And it's, it's brilliant. Damien is like, he said, I love players who talk at you all the time. So I'd love to see you. We're playing Man City on Saturday. Yeah. God knows they were going to mark Harlem, but I don't think Damien Delaney would have been fussed about marking Maybe. Harlem. I mean, yeah. we've got a bit of an injury crisis. Maybe give Delaney a bit of a call, get him out. And that'd there's that great, great photograph yeah. of Delaney with Costa when he basically, Delaney's clearly had enough and he's he's towering over him. <laughs> Diego Costa, who's, you know, the hard man's going, don't hit me, man, don't hit me. Like a sort of five-year-old in the primary school. Don't hit me. It's just fantastic. Um, so, going back to the first game, we always yeah. go off the tributaries, and yeah. I do like that. About the ground, Selhurst Park, what, yeah. did, did there anything apart from the slightly uh, bare pitch? Was there anything that struck you? Did, which part of the ground did you go to? Were you in the halfway? Were you in the homestay? Or for, for this game, we were in the halfway, which, of course, was... Uh, it was at the front, and I think they used to call it the paddock, because you had seats at the back of the half away, and it yeah. was standing at the front. The half away hasn't changed since. My season ticket's in the half away, and it's not fit for purpose. And there are lots of people who have said to Steve Parrish, it, it's going to make it, you know, your building, apparently, this wonderful stand. Mm. So it's going to be even worse for us, because we're going to be... Opposite, yeah. We're going to be the opposite. We're going to be cramped, queuing for an hour to get longer, and watching people on the other side of the pitch having tremendous fun in the state of the art <laughs> new new stand, but, but I know for that. But I, we were definitely in the half away for that. But I know afterwards because I from then on. So next season, I think I went to just about every home game, and the season after that, I started going to away games. So from then on, as so I went with my mate Steve and his his brother, so we used to go in the uh, the White Horse, which of course both ends were uncovered in those days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember, uh, apparently, smell is one of the most, um, mm -hmm. or one of the biggest triggers for the memory. Yeah. And of course, the smell of fried onions is legendary. I, I, I've got a habit of, I've, I can do a whole list of um, A-list celebrities I've accidentally upset. Um, and one of them is is Gordon Ramsay, who, uh, just just by sheer sheer coincidence, I ended up doing like four shows in four weeks that Gordon Ramsay was was a guest on, and I was like I was a, I was a guest on one of them, and I was writing on the others, so right. it just happened. To, and, and Gordon Ramsay's actually quite modest, and he was very good at taking advice and taking things. But um, it it just so so on the fourth show, I said, "Well, I'm going to one of your restaurants next week. It's, it's a special anniversary. My agent's taking me for, mm -hmm. for a meal at one of your restaurants." And he was, like, "Oh, great!" And, and and when I turned up, lo and behold, we were meet by the maitre d' so Mr. Ramsey's is a bottle of champagne, which is which was great. And the food was fantastic, it was great. But and then I saw Gordon two weeks after that and he went, he went, How was it? How was the meal? I said, Oh, no, it's great. It's one of the one of the best things I've ever eaten. He went, He said, What do you mean one of the best things you've ever eaten? <laughs> I said, Well the thing is, Gordon, it's it's context. And I said, It's it's one of the best things I've eaten. It, 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 I, in a way, it's the best thing I've eaten in a restaurant. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, the, the thing is, I said, there are times I, I, the best thing you've ever eaten is coming. I remember coming out of Highbury after Palace had beaten Arsenal unexpectedly and having a burger. And it's mm. that was the best thing I've ever eaten. You know, because yeah. it was, uh, and I said, there was, I remember I was filming once, freezing cold day, somebody bought me a bacon sandwich. That was the best thing. And he, he got really upset about the idea. That, you know, but, the smell of fried onions at the back of the White Horse was incredible. And I also remember, because the White Horse technically was the away end, but mm -hmm. segregation was was kind of, it wasn't taken that seriously. I remember yeah. when we'd been relegated, we played Rotherham. So the next, so when we were in, in Division Three, so this was two, the season after the season, mm -hmm. so two seasons after the, my first game, we played Rotherham. And I remember being fascinated along with all the other Londoners in the White House. There was two, this jolly couple from Rotherham who had red and white striped coats on yeah. and red and white striped rosettes and red and white. They looked like they'd stepped out of a Pathé news reel, except they were in, except they were in colour. Colour, yeah. And, and one of them actually had a rattle and we we're all just really fascinated by this. Wow. But my, my, uh, I, 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 I feel about Sellers Park the way I've... It, it didn't occur to me then that it was a shithole. 
because as you as you discover in the next couple of years, most grounds were like that. It 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 stood out that we didn't have even one covered end. I think for a long time, we were certainly the only club in the first division with without at least one covered end. That that did seem strange, but even now, it, it's the the two sides, the half away and the main stand, aren't really fit for purpose in modern football. To be perfectly be perfectly honest. I mean, the, the Arthur Waite was built in 1968, 69, and people were a little bit shorter then and, and a little bit lighter. And people weren't as fussed about having a drink at half time or there wasn't the options at half time. Whereas now it, it's uncomfortably dangerous in there sometimes at half time. And we have to, we have to basically draw lots to, to work out who's going to leave uh, at half past three to queue. Because that's the only way you can guarantee you get the drink. It's, it's not so, but I would defend it to other football fans. I will moan about it to other Palace fans, but to other football fans, I will defend it. Yeah, you know, whenever I get as as you inevitably do from people going, oh, I went to your game on Saturday. I was in the away end. It's yeah. your, you know, I was. Nice about, and, and talking of commentators as well, I remember having a conversation with Peter Dury. He was, a, he was a really good commentator. But I remember he, he used to write in The Independent, I think it was, and he wrote a match report about uh, a Palace game. And he, the whole, the first two paragraphs were like, you know, this is so, you're in a bad mood by the time you get there because it's so difficult to get to. Uh, you know, f- from my house in High Wycombe, it took me two and a half hours. So I I, I emailed him via the thing and said, that's all funny, from my house to Sellers Park, it takes me 20 minutes. <laughs> this is my local team. I mean, that's, you know, it's clearly an oversight back in 1905 or 1923. <laughs> clearly an oversight in 1920 when we built Sellers Park and we didn't think to ourselves, how difficult is it going to be to, oh, for, to get to High Wycombe? It's, it's, it, 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 it's not the best ground in the Premier League, but in, in the same way that Everton, I really like going to Everton. I love going mm-hmm. to Goodison Park. And the, the new ground looks incredible, but there will be... Everton fans, as there are still West Ham fans who miss Upton Park or the bowling ground, or whatever they bloody called it. You, 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 whatever, whatever you called it, West Ham fans would contradict you. And yeah, there's, there's no doubt, I, the London Stadium, especially I mean the away end, you know, that slight angle to the action. Anyway, Upton Park used to, oh, I used to hate going there as an away fan, but as a broadcaster, it was an amazing place to go to. Goodison Park is the same. Sellers Park is the same, but it's Goodison and Sellers are probably the last two bastions of, of old, oh, and that's exactly. and that's why old Everton fans will, Everton fans will admit again to themselves. Of course, we have to move ground. It isn't. It isn't right. It isn't fit. Mm. They're not going to admit that to any other fan, and, and it's the same with me. I'm not going to admit to any other fan that Sellers Park is technically a, 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 a shithole with mm. limited access for for you know uh, disabled and immobile fans, but. We all know it is, but it's it's also part of the charm, in a way, part of the rickety charm. And also we've got a ground where none of the sides or ends actually make any sense in relation to... No, they don't fit. No. ...to each other. They don't fit. I mean, it, it's a modern architect's nightmare. You really think, what have they done? And even the new stand, I mean, the new stand looks great in that model that's in the in reception, which I suspect yeah. even in five years' time is going to be the closest we get to, <laughs> to actually having it. It looks great. But also on the model, it look you, you go, it's four times as big as it, it's like the new the new Tottenham Stadium is incredible. It's an incredible stadium, but it's plonked down in this footprint like an alien spaceship. It's still in the middle of a really economically de- deprived part yeah, yeah. of London. And the the club and the architects have made no effort whatsoever to to sort of implement the the surrounding landscape into the ground. Oh. There's nothing. The foot you just suddenly you're walking down these this high street where half the shops are boarded over, and the the rest are kind of pound shops. And then suddenly you come across this this alien structure that's plonked down on 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 the same oh. as that. It's, it's it's really odd, and my my worry is if that if that new stand ever is built, it's just going to look so weird because it's mm. just dwarf everything else around it. Well, it's a bit like a spaceship just landing. Yeah, on it's Earth exactly what it's like. Just, yeah, this doesn't fit. It doesn't. Yeah. They, but of course, you you're someone who will always have an in, 
during Love of Selhurst Park because you had your wedding reception there. But we, we won't go into that. We, this we, is, we had, this um, is for another pod. We had two wedding receptions. We had one... I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, but the, the, the first one, so we got married and then we went um, uh, to Selhurst Park for our wedding reception. And then on the Monday, we had another wedding reception at the comedy store. So we had like a friends and family, friends and family and proper comedy mates. And then, but yeah, I, I to, to be with Glad All Over was played on the organ as we left the church. I don't know if you've heard Glad All Over being played on a church organ. The confetti was, was and Ali was very tolerant, I have to say. Um, right. But, but I'm uh, going to say Ali was very moved. She, I was, well, she was, of course she was moved. She finally <laughs> snared the man of her dreams. Of course she was moved. She got it, yeah. But, um, but the, the, and, and, of course, the wedding reception was at Sellers Park. And, we, I mean, we could not go on the pitch. So the, the, so about half past ten at night, you know, a drink had been taken and there was quite a few Palace fans and extended family just on the pitch with um, uh, an improvised ball Somebody found some sellotape from somewhere, probably Ali, because she's a stage manager. But we yeah. we got some. We made a ball out of sellotape and, and and newspaper and uh, kicked it about in the uh, on the pitch because it it was a close season. And nowadays you don't you you, you wouldn't put a foot over the touchline without mm-hmm. hugely angry grounds. It's a tall, angry groundsman is a tautology, obviously. But you don't yeah. go you don't go near the pitch now. But in those days they didn't give a they didn't give us stuff, so yeah. So uh, we've been, you know, we started in February 1973, wasn't it? Yeah, 73, uh, yeah. And we've sort of jagged back and forwards, which I I, I love love doing. And I, I just want to a couple more questions, but slightly yeah. unrelated to your first game. Sure. Can you remember? So you were, as you say, you were regular on match of the day too um, for uh, a long time. Yeah. Can you remember the first time you did a match of the day to piece at a stadium? Was that was that game imprinted in your memory? Yes, because the original idea for me on match of the day two was that I would be in the studio every right. Every, so for the first three weeks of match of the day two. I was in the studio and the idea was that I would do a kind of five minute stand up routine about the week's events. Uh, as, as, as they still do too good, too bad. So the idea was that I would do a bit of stand up and it'd be illustrated by, I think. Um, but for the first three weeks, much to Gordon Strachan's amusement, I got timed out because it was a new show. Um, they were still finding their feet. So for the first three weeks, I didn't actually, for the first two weeks, I was on the sofa and didn't speak. <laughs> so after after three weeks, they decided that this wasn't going to work and that they would they, they wanted to, to, to use me as a kind of roving reporter, which I wasn't particularly happy about. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so I remember my first one was uh, Norwich Palace, oddly enough, okay. uh, which was amazing. Then I did Portsmouth uh, Palace <laughs> again. And, not, and it, it was just by coincidence. I, the reason I went to Bournemouth, Bournemouth was that Harry Redknapp's PA was Southern England's leading Karen Carpenter lookalike. So that was the right. that, that was the hook. That was the hook <laughs> for the piece. And you, and Harry, how did how did you get away from the stampede? But, I mean, there must but, have been so many people going for that. But, but Harry, Harry, to his credit, Harry Redknapp is the most. He's an old fashioned wide boy, Harry, but he's the most mm-hmm. gracious host, Harry, and he's a fantastic, he's fantastic company, and he he gave us a, a lot of his time and was and bought into the idea, but Portsmouth. Portsmouth and Middlesbrough and Everton are probably the three friendliest clubs I've ever went to. Portsmouth, if I had asked, Portsmouth would let me get in the shower with the players, I think. So Portsmouth yeah. insisted that I, I that I be pitch side. I mean, and, and so I got a, an absolutely perfect view of Jose Fonte's own goal uh, against us in that particular game. So, yeah. so but I remember, because football, Palace has always been 
it's it's always it's very difficult to explain to non football fans, and and you know your your greatest fear is that you you go to a wedding and you're at a table with people who don't know about football because you think what do I talk to strangers about if they don't? Uh, it, it's very difficult because people. People make assumptions, and you know this, Richard. Even now, people make assumptions about football fans. They think they can't quite get their head around the fact that a football fan might have a decent job, might also like theatre, mm. might, in my case, like ballet and stuff. They can't get their head around that. They think if you like football, that's it. Um, but what what a lot of people can't is that football, and not just football, but Palace has been the baseline of, of my life. Whatever has gone on in my life, when when people have been ill when I've lost family, when things have gone well, when things have gone badly, Palace is always there to, to fall back on. And and your friends at Palace understand what's going on in your life, but they also understand that for that couple of hours in the pub and that couple of hours at Sellers Park, that, that's your refuge. It's, it, you know, it's like when Ali was ill, she understood. She encouraged me. She'd write, she'd she didn't want me huffing and puffing by her bedside on a Saturday afternoon, getting impatient and pretending that I wasn't checking the phone. She would encourage me to go to Paris. So it's always been there. And it's it's my identity. It's a, I come from a part of South London, which is sort of tooting, sort of Mitchum, sort of Streatham. If you don't know it, you, you can't explain to it. There's no landmarks. No one famous is from there. So Palace has always been the the baseline of my life. Football's always been in, in my life. Like, and so... So the match of the day two thing for me was actually the first three or four times I did it, I, I got re really quite emotional doing it because I, I still suffer now from imposter syndrome, but also the idea that I was doing matches, that I was allowed into Premier League dressing rooms, that I was on the pitch when yeah. players were coming out, that I was getting access to these people. I remember the first time I did a Palace game, we we, we lost and got relegated. It's just, uh, amazing, but I was so nervous because then I thought just walking around the pitch at Sellers Park. I've, I've done the occasional charity thing at Palace, uh -huh. yeah. but but actually uh, walking around the pitch at Sellers Park as part of match of the day was just like the most incredible thing. I just had these images of my 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 tiny childhood self who used to lie in front of the telly. That's how I watched telly. I used to lie on my side. I'd watch the foot. I'd watch match of the day. I'd watch the big match, the Thunderbirds, whatever it was. I used to lie on my side, twiddling my hair, and I had this vision of myself as a as a nine, ten year old who knew everything about football at that age, as we as we mentioned. And suddenly here I was doing match of the day at Sellers Park. It was just like I, was, I struggled to come to terms with it. It was incredible. And it, yeah. it's it's without a doubt, it's the best job. And the only reason I got the job is that the producer of Match of the Day 2 was a Palace fan, and he yeah. thought it'd be funny to have me involved. But it's it, it's still the best job I've ever done, Match of the Day 2. It's still... Is I still People say to me, what do you do for a living? I say, I'm a comedian. Even though I don't do many live gigs, I still think of myself yeah. as a comedian. <laughs> but, but being that bloke for Match of the Day 2, which I was for 11, 12 seasons, was... Was was wonderful. It was a privilege, and it helped that I was a Palace fan because, for most of it, because we got relegated in the, my, I think it was the second season I did match today. For most of the time, I was doing match today too. Palace were in the Championship and not doing particularly well, so it gave me a certain credibility amongst football fans that I supported. I think if I'd been a Man United fan or a Liverpool fan or an Arsenal fan, yeah. fans wouldn't have taken me quite so much to their heart in the way that they in the way that they did. But being a Palace fan and people knowing that I'd been in Palace fan through mo mostly thin rather than yes. thick, there was a there was a kind of grudging respect for that now, which which I probably wouldn't get if I was doing it now because you know Touchwood this season is still it's not fifty fifty, but it's, it's we're still we're, we're top of the bottom, which is which is great. And yeah. We, but yeah, it, yeah we, we're still approaching our twelfth season in the Premier League. I think if I was doing match of the day two now, I wouldn't get quite as much respect as I did back in the day because Palace are now seen as an established Premier League team. Touchwood. Yeah, indeed. And which I, which I don't think answered the question you originally asked me, but that's no. Tends... But I, I don't. I didn't really want you to ask that. <laughs> um, I want you to answer this one, though. So yeah. you talk about the emotional attachment. You talk about the association with certain events 
<clears throat> in your life and, and really important stuff, you know. So, you know, when people are ill, even when people die, it's it's something that connects. I wanted to ask you, have you ever taken anyone to their first game, assuming it's a Palace game? I'm going to guess, Ed, your son, was taken to a Palace game by yourself as his first game, and maybe Ali was taken to her first game by yes. you. Yeah, Am I um, right in thinking this? And can can you give Ali, us any context on that? I I did take Ali to her first football game, and it was a oh. Palace game, and it was uh, early in the nineties, and we were oh. playing Tot we were playing Tottenham, uh, okay. and unfortunately, just just one of those moments when it happens very rarely, but every now and again, a, a whole football ground will go quiet. For no apparent reason, it was just a, there's a lull in the play, and suddenly everything's really quiet. And and just at that moment, as it went quiet, Ali shouted "bollocks, ref," which she <laughs> was then known as "bollocks, ref" for the next five years. Here she is, is "bollocks, ref." It's like, oh, yeah. great, fine. And then it transpired that um, Ali had gone to school with Tim Flowers the Blackburn okay. goalkeeper, yeah. and, and Ali yeah. came to a, a Blackburn, Palace Blackburn game and just got quite rightly fed up because for the whole game, every time Tim Flowers, but, oh, there's Ali's boyfriend. All right. <laughs> They're all saying, Tim, Ali's here. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I, I took Ed to his first Palace game, but I took him far too young. Oh. Uh, he was he was only was about two. Yeah. Um, and it, it turned out, that he had this slight hearing problem when he was a kid. It's very common, but he couldn't hear sounds develop. And, and we 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 worked out, we were on a tube platform once, and we worked out there was an issue because he couldn't hear the train coming. So when the train right. suddenly appeared, it was... Uh, and it, yeah. so, we, uh, uh, so we took him to this game at Palace. It was, it was, um, it was a pre-season friendly. It was about 15,000 people. And he just hated the noise just freaked him out. So we had to take him... Taking away, so but I, I there's a chap who I think I, I know I've mentioned this to you before. He the, we we moved into the house I live in now in South London in Norbury, um, just over 10 years ago, so 10 and a half years. And the week we moved in, and this is not because we this is not why we moved in, but the week we moved in at the end of our road, this wonderful chap called Ash, who's Ethiopian, opened an off license, and and Ash had this idea that uh, Norbury was up and coming. So half the off-licence is the cheapest Polish lager you can imagine, and the other half is quite decent quality wine. And as it happened, Norbury hasn't been up and coming, so I'm pretty much the only person who buys into the good quality. But, but Ash loves it. Ash came to, to England from Ethiopia when he was 12. His parents sent him a, away. He came over by land to, to escape uh, violence. So he, loves, so he loves football. He's obsessed with football, Ash. He's a Man United fan. At any time of the day or night, you'll go into the shop and you'll be arguing with a Portuguese kid about Benfica or a oh. Polish kid about Gornik Zabra. He loves it. But but because him and I became mates, he became... Um, he still supports Man United. His kids support Palace, which I'm really proud of. But because he and I became uh, friends in, in the very <laughs> quickly, he... he because so, every time I went in, we would talk about football, and then he, he recognised me from the playing or something. And he started to to like. He really started to to like Palace and talk about Palace and refer to Palace as his second team. And he so about three seasons in, seven years ago. So we were in the. He said to me, "Is there any chance I could could I come to a Palace game with you?" So I said, "Of course." And he'd been he'd been to one Man United game that he'd got through some kind of Ethiopian trail. I don't know how, but he'd got himself corporate mm -hmm. tickets for this Man United game and he'd really enjoyed it. But he said, I'd love, I'd just love to come to, to sell us part. And it's like, Ash, of, of course. What, you, more than what? So took him and we we went for the whole half 11 in the Porsons experience, which he just absolutely loved. Because you know what it's like in there. Everyone's, there's a whole mix of people. There's lawyers, and and bus conductors and mini cab drivers, yeah. and musicians and as there are in every football club. There's you know there's people from all walks of life who support Palace. It's a very old fashioned throwback pub, which he loved. Everyone was really friendly. Oh, nice to meet you. Where are you from? Oh, and, he, and he knows his football. He loves his football. Um, at the time, Brighton were 
trying to get out of the championship and they were playing in the championship in the 12.30 kickoff and he couldn't understand why there was a Premier League game on but also Brighton were playing and the whole place, whoever it was who we were playing Brighton scored and the whole place went mad and, and Ash was going, what's what's happened? Why why are you cheering that goal? So of course we all we all explained to him the, the Brighton yeah. thing, which he couldn't get. He thought was just the most amazing thing that he'd he'd ever heard of. And and he, he went to the game and Palace won. And then he was just he was like a toddler for two weeks. Every time I didn't have to buy I didn't have to pay for a bottle of wine for two weeks. <laughs> but he just loved the whole experience. And I've taken him a couple of times. He he just because he, he grew up watching Premier League football. in, in, in if he's, And again, he he would tell you, even now, he will tell you every player and every kit. And every, but he I was so proud to take him to, to his first Palace game. And, I, and, it's so, and, and he still talks about it now. And it, I, you may have met my, my, it's, it's my cousin's son, Tom, mm-hmm. who used to live with us. He's from, he's from Bradford, um, who played... Uh, is a footballer. And he played for Whitehawk, um, oh, who yeah, in National yeah. League South for a couple of years, and he lived with us when he's playing at White. And when he when he first came down to live with us, his dad, my cousin Charlie, who's uh, old school Yorkshire. It, it, if your car was nicked in the old days, Charlie would be the, the one to tell you where it's probably able to find and the bits not. that hadn't been welded to another car. Basically, so he was. But Charlie had said to Tom, uh, "Like if you go, if you just keep your mouth shut in the pubs, don't say anything, because they'll clock you from the north and they'll be really, you know, they they won't like him." So uh, and Tom obviously loves football, so Tom came. It's the first game of the season, and Tom is impossibly handsome young man. Uh, Ed used to parade him up and down Old Compton Street just to, for the attention, basically. But but Tom came to his 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 first Palace game, and and. And after half an hour in the pub, he went, I'm going to have to phone my dad up. He said, these are just the nicest people I've ever met. Because, of course, he comes in, everyone goes, all right, mate. And he goes, he's my cousin, Tom, yeah. he's a footballer. And they're all like, oh, great, what are you, oh, yeah, what are you doing yeah. down here? And he went, I just, I, I've grown up thinking that Londoners were the most horrible, unfriendly, violent. But I said, that's what your dad thinks. But uh, we're, And he was like, and he never, and he, he, he still to this day, Tom was just going, oh, how's everyone in the Porsons? How's, uh, how's Mark getting on? How's Gads? And it's like, I, I'm really proud of that as well. So it's to actually taking someone to their first Palace game as a Palace fan is a, is a yeah. brilliant thing. To, and, and of course, uh, Exeter fans, you know, Mansfield fans will tell you the same thing when they take someone to their first game. Because we all think our club's special. The only thing is that we're we're the only ones that are right, essentially. Yeah. You know, the, the other ninety-one teams, their their fans are wrong. But there is that moment when you realise someone, and also it's it's fantastic to get an outsider's perspective on things that you sort of take for granted. Yeah. Uh, and you know the whole you know the the two o'clock shuffle when the team suddenly appears on everyone's phone is all sorts of stuff. The the fact that you you leave you know exactly how long it takes you to get from the pub to the ground and you you adjust your leaving times accordingly the fact that you turn left out of the bunny hole never right and these are all things that they go why do you do that and when you're having to explain something you love to somebody it's new to it's it actually gives you a fresh perspective on it it makes you realize how special it is and it's like then bringing them after us to the pub when palace have won and like already they're they're all like they're on first name terms with all, everybody they met before the before yeah. the game. There's, there's brilliant. There's there's nothing like that. Again, it comes back to that discussion about people who don't like football, because I've tried to explain to people, and I do. I love the theatre. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to see Ian McKellen next week and Henry IV. I can't wait. I I like ballet. I like live music. I like all sorts of live entertainment, but there is nothing like the anticipation. Of, of a Palace game and there's nothing like the aftermath of a successful play. You know, I, I, I've come out of Shakespeare plays on you know, walking on, I think that was brilliant. Mm. You, you, you're not going to a pub with loads of other Shakespeare fans who think it was equally brilliant yeah. and, it, and it doesn't have the same meaning for you in terms of of the outcome. You know, whereas mm. with, with football, and there's nothing, for me, you can't explain to people. For me, I, I, I love it when we were at home when we were at home on Boxing Day and you know on Boxing Day Christmas is my favourite time I love winter I love Christmas 
And you know, on Boxing Day, Boxing Day is a game where all the absent friends are here. People, you know, yeah. people are away. That's the game they tend to be at. And when the place is just, it's just red and blue, and you don't have to explain anything to anyone. It's like you and I are talking on this this pod, or when we talk on Palace pods, you don't have to give context to anything. If I'm doing another, if I'm doing talk sport, for example, or if I'm doing a, a, a general football podcast. And you, you you have to explain Don Rogers or Dave Swindlehurst yeah. or Jerry Murphy or or the, the the really bad players like Tommy Langley. When we do in a palace, you don't have to explain it. So when you're in a when you're in a, in a pub, especially now, when I look at people who who I've been out to football with since I was six or seven, who are now grandparents, and you look at their grandkids in their palace kit and their and you, the, every like I say everything's red and but it just it fills me full of pride and 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 love because it's just and I, d- I don't know what I would do if that was ever taken away from me and I, there's no reason why it would be but just it, almost to the extent that the, the the actual game I think you know being older gives you a, a bit more yeah. <sighs> What's the word? Perspective, doesn't it? On life. So, yeah, so, yeah. so, yeah. Relegate. I'd be, I'd be devastated if we were relegated. I really, really would, because I know the effect it would have on the club. I know people would be made redundant, and I know the foundation yeah. would be. I, I would be devastated. But as long as we got a club to go, as long as I could go to the Porsons Arms every week for two weeks, I, I'm not that fast. Because we've been through, both of us have been through twice, the, the administrations. Yeah. But both of which could have led to liquidation. The second time we had an administration in 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 twenty ten, we were five minutes away from from having to to start a Phoenix club. So, so when you've been through the notion that this club might not be here, the, the fact that it still is, and that you can still go to the, the the same pub to talk the same bollocks to the same people that you have done for thirty years, which is exactly how Ali puts it, but in a way that means she understands it. That's that's fine. So, and if you said to me, right, you can go to the Porsons for two hours, but you can't go to the game, I'd go, oh, all right. But I'd, I'd rather have the Porsons bit than the game bit, to be perfectly yeah. honest, sometimes, you know. Yeah. Well, what a journey. We've been started on Saturday, the 17th of February, 1973. We've gone via <laughs> Gordon Ramsay. We've gone via <laughs> Richard Osman being held up by David. <laughs> and it's, you know, that is... The beauty of football, it takes you to all these different places. There is the jeopardy, as we say. Yeah, yeah. Um, my worry, Kevin, is that you're going to make Palace so attractive now that you're going to have to queue up to get into the Porsons, which <laughs> I've never done, but I'm thinking this could happen one day. And, and that would be a sign of, you know, things have moved to the next level when you have to get a ticket to get into the Porsons to get that cheese roll. And you to do get that kind of Guinness. Oh, those but, big, um, che- those big. Che- do you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm almost ashamed to say this, but I, I have a deal with Graham and Bev, who run the Porsons Arms. Okay. That every time I crowbar their name into uh, a talk sport or five live interview, I get free drinks for the next two games. Okay. So, which is why does this podcast count? Would I think it might, it might do. Can of coke because pe- people often say to me, "You're always mentioning that bloody pub." I said, "Yeah, I know," because it gets me free drinks. <laughs> well, I'll look forward to uh, seeing you there on Saturday for the Man City game. Hopefully, fairly early doors. Uh, early kick off, yeah, yeah, but st- yeah, still, yeah. it will st- I'll st- still be there at half nine, ten o'clock, whenever, it, whenever it's officially well, allowed to open in case any of the Croydon Constabulary are listening to this podcast. <laughs> um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and we could go on for a few more hours, I think. But, yeah, we, you know, yeah. I think probably our wives time. probably need yeah. us to talk to them about <laughs> no. the latest King Lear production. So <laughs> we need to rip ourselves away. I, I actually enjoyed that King Lear at the Almeida. It was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But um, been fantastic to talk to you. And you, uh, mate. Pleasure. Thank you. Always a pleasure. See you uh, at the Paulsons. I'll see you on Saturday. Sooner yeah. rather than later. Yeah. All right. Bye. Cheers. Bye